St. George! The English shouted, but the saint must have been sleeping, for he gave the attackers no help. More stones were hurled from the ramparts, then a great mass of flaming straw was heaved into the crowded attackers. A man succeeded in reaching the top of the breach, but was immediately killed by an axe that split his helmet and skull in two. He slumped on the rungs, blocking the ascent, and the Earl tried to haul him free, but was struck on the head by one of the boulders and collapsed at the ladder's foot. Two of his men-at-arms carried the stunned Earl back to the camp, and his departure took the spirit from the attackers. They no longer shouted. The arrows still flew, and men still tried to climb the wall. But the defenders sensed they had repelled this sixth attack, and their crossbow bolts spat relentlessly. It was then Thomas saw the blackbird on the tower above the gate. He laid the steel arrow tip on her breast, raised the bow a fraction, and then jerked his bow hand so that the arrow flew wild. Too pretty to kill, he told himself, and knew he was a fool for thinking it. She shot her bolt and vanished. A half dozen arrows clattered onto the tower where she had been standing, but Thomas reckoned all six archers had let her shoot before they loosed. Jesus wept, Skeet said. The attack had failed, and the men-at-arms were running from the crossbow bolts. One ladder still rested against the breach, with the dead man entangled in its upper rungs. Back, Skeet shouted, back! The archers ran, pursued by quarrels, until they could push through the hedge and drop into the ditch. The defenders were cheering, and two men bared their backsides on the gate tower and briefly shoved their asses towards the defeated English. Bastards, Skeet said. Bastards! He was not used to failure. There has to be a bloody way in, he growled. Thomas unlooped the string from his bow and placed it under his helmet. I told you how to get in. He told Skeet, told you at dawn. Skeet looked at Thomas for a long time. We tried it, lad. I got to the stakes, Will. I promise I did. I got through them. So tell me again, Skeet said, and Thomas did. He crouched in the ditch under the jeers of La Roche de Rien's defenders, and he told Will Skeet how to unlock the town. And Skeet listened, because the Yorkshireman had learned to trust Thomas of Houghton. Thomas had been in Brittany for three years now, and though Brittany was not France, its usurping duke brought a constant succession of Frenchmen to be killed, and Thomas had discovered he had a skill for killing. It was not just that he was a good archer. The army was full of men who were as good as he, and there was a handful who were better. But he had discovered he could sense what the enemy was doing. He would watch them, watch their eyes, see where they were looking, and as often as not, he anticipated an enemy move and was ready to greet it with an arrow. It was like a game, but one where he knew the rules and they did not. It helped that William Skeet trusted him. Skeet had been unwilling to recruit Thomas when they first met by the jail in Dorchester, where Skeet was testing a score of thieves and murderers to see how well they could shoot a bow. He needed recruits and the king needed archers, so men who would otherwise have faced the gallows were being pardoned if they would serve abroad and fully half of Skeet's men were such felons. Thomas, Skeet had reckoned, would never fit in with such rogues. He had taken Thomas's right hand, seen the calluses on the two bow fingers, which said he was an archer, but then he had tapped the boy's soft palm. What have you been doing? Skeet had asked. My father wanted me to be a priest. A priest, eh? Skeet had been scornful. Well, you can pray for us, I suppose. I can kill for you, too. Skeet had eventually let Thomas join the band, not least because the boy brought his own horse. At first, Skeet thought Thomas of Houghton was little more than another wild fool looking for adventure. A clever fool, to be sure. But Thomas had taken to the life of an archer in Brittany with alacrity. The real business of the Civil War was plunder, and day after day, Skeet's men rode into land that gave fealty to the supporters of Duke Charles, and they burned the farms, stole the harvest, and took the livestock. A lord whose peasants cannot pay rent is a lord who cannot afford to hire soldiers. So Skeet's men-at-arms and mounted archers were loosed on the enemy's land like a plague. And Thomas loved the life. He was young, and his task was not just to fight the enemy, but to ruin him. He burned farms, poisoned wells, stole seed grain, broke plows, fired the mills, ring-barked the orchards, and lived off his plunder. 
Skeet's men were the lords of Brittany, a scourge from hell, and the French-speaking villagers in the east of the duchy called them the Elka, which meant the devil's horsemen. Once in a while, an enemy warband would seek to trap them, and Thomas had learned that the English archer, with his great long war bow, was the king of those skirmishes. The enemy hated the archers. If they captured an English bowman, they killed him. A man-at-arms might be imprisoned, a lord would be ransomed, but an archer was always murdered. Tortured first, then murdered. Thomas thrived on the life, and Skeet had learned the lad was clever, certainly clever enough to know better than to fall asleep one night when he should have been standing guard, and for that offence, Skeet had thumped the daylights out of him. You were goddamn drunk, he had accused Thomas, then beat him thoroughly, using his fists like blacksmith's hammers. He had broken Thomas's nose, cracked a rib, and called him a stinking piece of Satan shit. But at the end of it, Will Skeet saw that the boy was still grinning, and six months later, he made Thomas into a vintenar, which meant he was in charge of 20 other. Those 20 were nearly all older than Thomas, but none seemed to mind his promotion, for they reckoned he was different. Most archers wore their hair cropped short, but Thomas's hair was flamboyantly long and wrapped with bow cords, so it fell in a long black plait to his waist. He was clean-shaven and dressed only in black. Such affectations could have made him unpopular, but he worked hard, had a quick wit, and was generous. He was still odd, though. All archers wore talismans, maybe a cheap metal pendant showing a saint or a dried hare's foot, but Thomas had a desiccated dog's paw hanging round his neck, which he claimed was the hand of St. Guinefort. And no one dared dispute him, because he was the most learned man in Skeet's band. He spoke French like a nobleman and Latin like a priest. And Skeet's archers were perversely proud of him because of those accomplishments. Now, three years after joining Will Skeet's band, Thomas was one of his chief archers. Skeet even asked his advice sometimes. He rarely took it, but he asked. And Thomas still had the dog's paw, a crooked nose.